All right, amen. Good to see you again. And glad you're here. Looking forward to God speaking to our hearts. Oh boy, what a message again, right? <laughs> oh, folks, folks, folks. Um, I want you to think about this before we uh, preach, so I want it to be on your mind uh, before we uh, get started. Um, uh, how many of you would say that uh, at one time in your life that, uh, and you may still be that way, and really probably most of us are at some time or another during the day, uh, have lived in a state of confusion? <laughs> Anybody? Or everybody? Yeah. Right. The Bible says that God, God, okay, is not the author of confusion, right? And, uh, but we're not God, <laughs> right? right? And so we need God's help to help us to navigate, right, uh, through this sea. <laughs> and that's what it is. It's a wide sea of confusion. And uh, we need a navigator. And his name is Jesus. Uh, and he's got one book, and it's called the Bible. And uh, today we're going to finish up, well, we're not going to finish up the, the whole sermon uh, on the mount, but um, Jesus has finished, I believe, uh, his sermon. And so we're going to move from the sermon to the application to the choosing uh, in verses 13 in the rest of the passage of Scripture. And so today we're going to do something unusual. I said that to the Sunday school class, and you, and you say, we always do something unusual here. <laughs> but today, you're going to have to bear with me because God wants me to do this, and so I'm going to do this. I'm going to read all of chapter 5 and all of chapter 6 and everything we've read up until this point uh, when we get ready to preach, and it's important. How many of you have made this statement or heard me make this statement? Because I know I've made it before, and I know you've made it before. Probably if you've ever taught or preached, you've said this right here. For the sake of time. Y'all ever said that, teachers? For the sake of time, and, and what are we really saying when we said it? I've been meditating upon this. We're really saying that what I have to say is more important than what God has to say oftentimes in the Word of God. We say, well, we're not going to read this for the sake of time. Isn't that a yikester moment? <laughs> like, oh, well, i got to make sure I get what I said. And, and, but really, the Bible says it's the Word of God that's quick and powerful and sharp and the need two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, and is a discerner or a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen. Yikes. So what you need more so is God's word, amen? So let's pray and uh, enjoy the singing uh, and uh, enjoy the congregational singing, the choir singing, and uh, get ready for what Jesus has to say in his word as he tells us that it's time. It's time to apply. It's time to heed what we've heard. Ooh, God help us. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for who you are. We thank, thank you, God. It's impossible possible. We've already seen that through many messages. We know this from your word. It's impossible to live out what you say we're supposed to live out without you living it out through us. We must yield. We must give our lives to you. And Father, we must let you work these things out in our lives. Dear God, we ask for your help. Our help coming from the Lord. And Father, we pray that you bless the choir, bless the congregational singing, bless everything that takes place here. Uh, the, this morning may it not be our idea, but it may it be what you say in your word. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name for his sake. Amen.
notes this morning, please, and turn to page three. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let's stand and sing all four verses, please. Page three. <laughs> Appreciate him. Say amen. 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 Appreciate Brother Richie and teaching. And then the Winston Rescue Mission is our missionary of the month. They have several needs that they have sent to us, and uh, we'll let you know about those, and uh, so we can help them. And, and uh, as they continue to reach the down and out, and uh, most of all to get on the gospel. And then Tom Tillis, NC Senator, certainly want to pray for him. And then the Siler City Police Department want to lift him up uh, to the Lord in prayer. Don't forget, uh, October 30th is coming Saturday. We are pig picking at Miss Margaret's house at 4 p.m. We're trying to decide whether or not we're going to go whole hog. Uh, we will, that's between us. And so y'all don't know what that means. And so anyway, we're, we're, we're debating on that. And so, But you'll know it. You'll know whether or not we went whole hog when you come, all right? Make sure you bring a dessert and uh, a drink if you would. It'll be a good time. Invite some folks uh, to come to that. It'll be great. Great time of fellowship. 
be able to talk to people about the Lord and about church and, and uh, just about life and what life's all about. Our lives should be revolved around the Lord Jesus, and certainly we should want to tell other people about Him. All right? And then don't forget, November the 7th and the 21st uh, will be choir practice, and uh, we are practicing for the Christmas music. And on that note, uh, we're either going to do December the 5th or December the 19th. Uh, the, the choir will be doing the music, uh, 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 doing the Christmas music uh, during that time. And then we're going to have a, a lunch or dinner, whatever you want to call it, right after that. And we'll have an evening service. But it'll either be December the 5th or the 19th, leaning towards the 19th. And uh, looking forward to that. And uh, we'll give you more details. But Christmas will be right on us before we know it, yeah, won't it? Yeah. We'll probably just skip right through November and December will be upon us. And, uh, but anyway, looking forward to that. Choir's been practicing real hard. And, uh, and so those, some of those songs are still going through my mind during the day. as We've been practicing them. And so we look forward to that Sunday having that. want to make sure everybody will be able to come. And so we'll do it Sunday morning and then we'll have a, a little uh, lunch afterwards. Well, we won't make it a little lunch. It'll be a big lunch. All right, how about that? Amen.
Jesus' name. I'm glad that you're here. Let me just give you a couple of prayer requests. I certainly want to pray for the Lily Johnson family. She passed away yesterday about 8.40 in the morning. And uh, they'll have the funeral service this coming Saturday, Jesse, here in Granite Falls. And uh, so lift them up to the Lord in prayer if you would. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, pray for Daryl. Uh, he's down in his back. And so just lift him up in prayer if you would. Continue to pray for uh, Suzanne. Continue to lift her up as she continues to heal. And uh, praise the Lord that the surgery went well and uh, she is feeling better. And glad that she's healing up good. I uh, do pray for Bree. Bree's in for this weekend. And uh, just continue to lift her up in prayer. You know, again, difficult situation there. And so just pray that God will continue to touch her heart. Glad that Anna and Jesse are still able to uh, have a relationship with them and that they feel free to let her come. And so have a little birthday party for her this afternoon. Uh, best foods and so we're looking forward to that just pray that you could be a blessing uh, to her and, uh, and to her family and of course lift up all those on the prayer list uh, that don't know the Savior continue to pray that God would help us daily be a witness to those that need Jesus and uh, again that's many that we come in contact with right and uh, so we certainly need to pray there uh, not on the bulletin there but uh, Lucy's nephew did pass away we mentioned that to the church, but what was his name again? Roger Gaines. Roger Gaines, all right. All right, <coughs> certainly. Uh, and several people had asked me if Roger was saved, and I wasn't sure, but uh, he was saved. Praise the Lord. Okay, amen. Good. Yes. It's good to hear. Amen. All right, sir, we pray for the Roger Gaines family. Uh, lift them up to the Lord in prayer. All right, any other requests? Yes. Tristan's family. Yes, let's pray for Tristan's family. This is a young man that uh, we know and uh, just a lot, a lot going on there. So if you just remember, you can just call out Tristan's family uh, to the Lord. That would be great. Um, just a lot of different things going on there with his family. Anybody else requests? So I want to pray. Yes, Janie. saved most of all and uh, pray for his physical condition that he could come to the place to trust Christ. Yes, Miss Lucy. Yes, Pastor Bobby, this morning I've been having a problem with a sciatic nerve, but this morning I could hardly walk. Mm. But I said, the devil, I'm going to church and thank God I feel better. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Appreciate your faithfulness, Miss Lucy. All right, sir, and lift her up. And also, Miss Lisa's got a sciatic nerve problem today, too, so pray for her. Yeah. Any of you that had a sciatic nerve problem knows how that is. Whoa. I've had it myself, and so ooh, yeah. we can uh, empathize with you and pray for you. And we sure will. Anybody else? All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Brother Sam, pray for these for us, if you would, please. Oh, uh, also, uh, do pray. continue to pray for Barbara Marley. Uh, just uh, talk with her this week. Um, she said it's not going as well as they would like to as far as the auction, the bids not coming in very well. Uh, and so pray, again, as I'm praying the Lord's will be done, right? God knows exactly what bids need to come in, how much she needs uh, for her life. This is, uh, if you were dependent upon your, your rest of your life and everything, you would want it to go exactly the way God wanted it to go, right? And, uh, and she, needs, she needs those funds uh, to live and so but God knows that right amen and so we can take this to the Lord in prayer and ask him to uh, thwart anything to, to stop that from happening amen brother Sim pray for us please sir our heavenly father we are thankful to come into thy presence and as we've been reminded this morning already amen. only thou art holy amen. there is none beside thee we we come before thee this morning realizing that this is application day. We've already heard in our Sunday school class that uh, how the Samaritans hated the Jews and the Jews hated the Samaritans and the disciples were ready to call down fire from heaven. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ, merciful and loving and gracious, rebuked them and cared
cared for the Samaritans just as much as he cared for the Jews. Our Father, we are reminded in Mark uh, 14, verse 1, how that the chief priests and the scribes sought how they, they might take the Lord Jesus craftily and kill him. But we're thankful that in verse 8, there was a woman who did all that she could to bring him honor and glory. And our Father, we realize that we could be on either side. Sure. We have to make the application to our lives as we're going to what, obey your word or ignore it. God help us. And our Father, uh, those decisions need to start today. Sure. So we pray that as our brother Bobby gives up the word this morning and uh, confronts us with the decisions that really need to be made, that our hearts might be open, that our wills might be yielded. We pray, our God, that we might not harden our hearts against the word of God, but that we might realize that it is uh, thou who art holy, that there is none beside thee, and the same is true of thy word. And really the choice seems like it should be uh, easy for us to make, but we struggle. Give us the help that we need. And our Father, for all those who have been mentioned for prayer, whether it's for salvation or for comfort, for healing, Father, we lift them up to Thee and pray that even though uh, they may not be with us, that they might also be uh, confronted with these decisions in their lives and that they might choose Thee over everything else. And that it might be true for us as well. We commit ourselves to thee in the worthy and precious name of thy Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Could you turn your Bibles, first of all, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, because that's where we're going to pick up our reading. I was sitting there thinking as Sim uh, was praying, um, like Jeremiah, like uh, John the Baptist, like a lot of these uh people, Elijah, and different ones, I'm uh, so far, again, away from them and the way they uh, uh, serve their uh, their God and my God, uh, but it's, boy, sometimes you just would rather be down there. <laughs> You'd rather, I'd rather be sitting where you're sitting uh, than to be up here. And then I thought this, I said, you know, there's a time where I sat there and I said, you know, I'd like to be up there. And uh, tell them like it is. <laughs> but that ain't the way it works, folks. I tell you, any preacher that uh, just wants to get up here and tell you like it is, he's got a problem. He's got a problem with himself and he's got a problem with God. Because really, there's no man that can tell you like it is. As far as him telling you like it is. As I search the scriptures and I look all through the Bible... It's always been and always will be from the very beginning. Thus saith the Lord. Yeah. And as Vance Havner once said, and I've quoted to you this many a time, but this is so hard. This is not an easy thing, folks. It's just not. We live in a tough day today. There's no doubt about it, but it doesn't mean that every day wasn't tough because all days are tough to serve God. That's just facts. It, there's, no, there's no easy way out. And uh, I think, and I hope that you see that from the message today. But at the end of the day, God wants us to follow him wholeheartedly, to, to listen to his word and to, to trust him. And ultimately, it's what God says. Vance Abner said this, it's not the preacher or the teacher's responsibility to make the message acceptable. It's to make it available. And that's what I'm here for. I thought about what Miss Lucy has said down through the years, walking out those doors. She says, Pastor, Pastor, you're not responsible. We're responsible. You preached the word to us, and now we're responsible to do what God would have us to do with what you have preached. And that's so true. This is not up to me. It's up to you to respond to God and what God says in his word. And so we do come to a place in the Sermon on the Mount 
where at the beginning of this passage of Scripture, maybe you don't remember, at the very beginning of the passage of Scripture, in chapter 5, where did Jesus go? Now maybe you already looked at it right there, but where did Jesus go? He went up, up into the mountain, right? Y'all remember that? It's been a long time ago, hasn't it? I'm trying to get you to remember a thing months ago. <clears throat> Jesus went up, to the uh, went up to the mountain, but he saw the multitudes. And he went up into the mountain. And then what happened? They followed. Who followed him? The disciples. Remember, this is, this is so important. That's why we're saying this to you. Because at the very beginning of the sermon, the Bible says that Jesus went up and he separated himself from the multitude and from the crowd. And he went up into the mountain. And then the Bible says that the disciples separated themselves from the crowd to hear what he had to say. Are you with me? So the disciples separated themselves from the crowd to hear what Jesus had to say. Now we get down to chapter 7, verse number 13 and following, and we see it's time to heed what they've heard. It's time to heed what they've heard. And really the truth of the matter is, for all of us in here, you haven't heard all the messages, but you can go back and you, and it's not really, it's not really what important, the important thing is not what I preached, per se, but it's what Jesus preached and what he said in this sermon. And so you can go back and you can read it for yourself and you can hear it, but we're going to read it right now because we're going to catch us all up to speed, Right? Certainly you're not going to be able to take in everything that's being said here in chapter 5 and 6 and, and verses uh, 1 through 12. But ultimately, Jesus has finished the sermon. They've heard what he said. And now he says, it's time to heed what you've heard. You see, because that's really what matters, folks, in life. Amen. It's what matters. If life really is all about God and all about Jesus and all of these things... What matters is what he says and whether or not we heeded it or not. That's all that matters in life. And see, that's why Jesus won. And even you go to the book of Revelation, Richie has already gone through that, and we've gone through it here at the church, through the seven churches of Revelation. Jesus said to them there, again, he that had ears to hear, let him hear. He said it while he was on earth. He said it when he left, and he comes back, and he's telling John to write this down. Why? Because it's not enough just to hear the message. You must heed it. And that shows that you really heard it and that you really believed what you heard. And that's what you're going to see here. But chapter 5, 6, and up to this point is the whole sermon. So let's look at that. Verse number 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, ready... His disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now let's just stop right there for a minute. This is not the typical <laughs> of people wanting, now when you come to this sermon, it's not typical of anything else. This is not the way that you would think that you would be blessed. Poor, mourning, and meek. Can you imagine that in our society today? There's very few people that are like that, aren't they? But that's the way you got to come to Jesus. Because we're all, again, spiritually bankrupt. We have nothing to offer God in our own righteousness. We need to see that. Then he says, blessed are they to do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when, ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Wow, that sounds like a whole lot of blessing, doesn't it? Not in terms of what we think blessing is. And so then he says, rejoice. Rejoice over this and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. 
For so persecuted they the prophets which were before ye. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is sent forth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God, your Father, which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall, uh, whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, notice that he said that, shall do and teach them, right? It's so much easier to teach them than to do them. That's why I said I would probably better be down there than up here. He says this, <clears throat> excuse me, and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say uh, to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rememberest that, that thy brother hath all against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, and be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily or truly I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body shall be cast into hell. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a, right, a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, save him for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Again, ye have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So again, through this so far, Jesus is saying, put into practice, you know, <clears throat> what you say you're going to do. He says, listen, it's not just the outward act. It's the inward man. And it's the heart that matters. And that's what comes out of every sin and every sense of pride and all of these other kind of things that we do. It comes out of our hearts. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes, they taught, as long as you did the outward acts, you're okay. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, it's your heart that matters. You can do all of these things and still be not right with God. Then he comes down, he said, you have heard it has been said, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, verse 38. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. 
give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, turn, that, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What a different day this is today, isn't it? This doesn't go over well. And I, 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 the people today, you, you got so many crazies out there in the world, and, and, and it's, it's just weird. How people take the Bible and say, hey, I would rather follow the teachings of Jesus than follow the teachings of Paul. <laughs> they don't have a clue, do they, of what Jesus is saying, a person that makes that statement, right? The Apostle Paul was only saying what Jesus was saying. But I'm going to tell you what, this sermon is hard. This sermon is tough. This sermon is difficult. And you will not do this on your own. And boy, if we could just read that right there. And we'd say, my goodness. Like Paul just prayed. We're in trouble, folks. We're in a day today where we are unholy. We need God to help us to see this in our own hearts and lives. Why? Because the culture has had a drastic effect upon us rather than us have an effect on the culture. And really, the effect on the culture is winning people to Jesus. And that's the only way they're going to have true change in their lives. And so he comes and he says, that ye may be the children of, of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. He said, For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute the brethren only, what do ye more than others? Hopefully you can recall that message we preached on that a while back. But it doesn't even matter. What matters is what Jesus says right here. What do you do more than others? Do not the publicans do this? Do, uh, do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. What a command. What a, a statement of scripture. And it's impossible for any one of us to be perfect without God and his righteousness. And so then he comes, and we talked about this in chapter 6. He talks about our spiritual things in life. He's going to talk about the spiritual. He's going to talk about uh, just the everyday things of life in chapter 6. And so here he says this, take heed. Boy, we ought to take heed. That you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Let me stop right there, just a minute. We talked about this too. It's not, it's really impossible. Again, let's say for instance, I do something for Lucy Price. I'm going to use you, Miss Lucy. I do something for Miss Lucy. It's really impossible for Miss Lucy not to know. Now, it could be. It depends on what it is, okay? But if I do something for her, you know, it's, it's impossible for me not to think of Lucy and do this for her and do what God would have me to do. But I don't need to do it for Lucy, right? And, and then come to the whole congregation. Guess what I did for Lucy yesterday or, or last week or last month? I, I got my reward, right? There's no need for me to do that. Now, listen, folks, we're all guilty of this. Now, you might not be. You, you may be different. But we all want people to know about our righteousness. And God's got to kill that in us. Folks, listen to me. I'm just telling you. Now, I'm up here again. Y'all sitting down there. Y'all hear about me. But I don't get to hear a whole lot about you. Right? But you're just like me. How do I know that? Because God told me you were. <laughs> so you can lie to yourself, and you can lie to me, and you can lie to God, but you're just like me. Because we're all like this, and we all need God. Amen. We need his help, because what he requires is literally, literally impossible for any man to do. Go back to what Jesus said in chapter 5. I've come not to, to destroy the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. And he did, praise God. And he's still fulfilling them today. And he's fulfilling them in us. You're not doing it on your own. Let's continue to read. 
he says um, in verse number five, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. For they uh, uh, disfigure their faces, they, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly." Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For your treasure is there where your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either you hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor, nor for your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his statue? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, and that's what's important, isn't it? It's what he says unto us. That Solomon, even Solomon, in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or withal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these in his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, i got to stop right here again and, 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 and talk about this just for a few minutes. What a sermon, right? David, what a sermon. What God has to say. Now, here's the thing. Some of you in here are already thinking about tomorrow. You're already thinking about what you're going to do later on and all these other kind of things. God, God says we need to focus on the here and now. What does God want to say to us right now? What is his purpose? What is his plan? What does he want me to do with this message? And boy, that's what you ought to be thinking about because that's what's going to be important for today. Whether you choose to do what God, trust and obey him or trust and obey you, yourself. God help us. Then he comes to this great next section here, which we talked about. Chapter 6 was all about the Father and having that relationship with him. 
and uh, enjoy in that relationship. It wasn't about religion. It was about relationship. You can have the Pharisees and the scribes and, and you can you know, have the Mormonism and the Catholicism and all the other isms today. But what we need first and foremost today is a relationship with Jesus Christ, with our Father, by the power of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And then he comes to great, uh, this great chapter 7. And remember, again, these are uh, the, the people that did this. We're, we're grateful that they divided the word of God. But remember, this is one sermon. This was all together, one letter, uh, one book that Matthew wrote. And uh, we appreciate those that divided it up. And, and, uh, but here it's continual. He says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But consider not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out thy mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam, a two by four, is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? Whom, if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye, then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things, okay? And then Luke, the Luke passage of Scripture, the complimentary passage to this, it says, how much more shall God give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Because all good things come from the Holy Spirit of God and come from God. And so then he comes down to verse 12. He says, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would do that men should do to you, do even... Do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophecy. You could say this is what the Bible says, the golden rule, that we are to do unto others as we, as we would have them do unto us. Now, all of us could say a hearty, I hope. Amen or, or, or probably oh me. Because really, the truth of the matter is, is that's what we're getting ready to ask you, right? Because you all should know by now what the word amen means, right? So be it, right? God says it, and you say, Lord, so be it. Isn't that exactly what Mary said when she said, how can, how can these things be? <laughs> I mean, he's, now, you know, when, when the angel uh, was talking to Mary and talking about the birth of Jesus, he was talking about the impossible. <laughs> he was talking about the virgin birth. He was talking about what only the Holy Spirit could do. And Mary said, I don't know a man. How can these things be? And he explained it to her. Amen. And by the way, God would explain some things to us if we truly wanted to obey him. Maybe that's the problem with me, with you, and everybody else. Would he not? Yes. Mary said, be it as you said to your handmaid. She realized who she was. She was poor in spirit. <laughs> Amen. Spiritually bankrupt. I'll tell you, now we say these kind of things, you know, but Mary's not in the grave, is she? <laughs> my Bible says when Jesus rose from the dead he took captivity captive <laughs> amen he took those that were in Abraham's bosom he took them to the third heaven he took them to be with him did he not isn't that what the Bible says that he took those spirits that were there in paradise are y'all with me did, did he do that <laughs> amen and so I was going to say this Mary would roll over her grave if she heard what the Catholic Church said about her She's not in the grave, is she? She's with Jesus. But she still, if she was in the grave, she'd roll in the grave to see what the Catholic Church says about her. She didn't exalt herself. She knew she needed a Savior. 
just like everybody else. Amen. We all need a Savior. So Jesus comes to this point, and he's given all these things. And boy, I tell you, this is a mouthful to swallow, isn't it? This is not something you just say, okay, <laughs> let's go and do it. No, this is going to take some thought. And that's why he comes to this particular thing here and these particular two verses here in verses 13 and 14, and he says this. He says, enter ye. Does that sound like a decision to you? For you to make? Oh, hello. Anybody out there? How about YouTube? How about YouTube land? That's a decision, isn't it? Enter ye. Enter ye at the in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. <clears throat> and many there be which go in thereat. You ought to mark in your Bible right there. There's just two key words. Well, there's a lot of key words. So it, it, okay. You ought to mark in your Bible that word, many. Because that's important, isn't it? He says there's many on this wide gate or broad way. A way that's kind of like this. All roads lead to heaven. Doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe in God. That's the broad way. You ain't making it that way. But there's a whole lot of people on it. By the way, there's a whole lot of people that claim to be Christians are on that way. Unfortunately. We need to be careful. This is serious, isn't it? This is life. This is your eternal destiny. This is heaven and hell. He said there's many people on this broad way to hell. He said, why? Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be. You ought to mark that word. Those are the two key words. Many and few. There be that find it. Oh, there's so much here, so much to, to, to look at. But I want you to visualize with me just a minute on the way to view this. How many of you have ever been, and I, I might have preached this before, I don't know if I did or not when I preached this, I don't know, what, 15, 14 years ago. I know I've said this before, but this is what came to my mind as I was visualizing this passage of Scripture. And I hope this will help you. How many of you have ever been through a turnstile? Most everybody, right? How many people can you get in a turnstile at one time? One. You got to go in one at a time. One at a time. It's an individual choice, isn't it? To go through that turnstile. Right? So I want you to visualize the, the turnstile of, of, of salvation and discipleship and all that God has said here. It's a turnstile. And you're standing there. It's just you. There's other people behind you. There's other people that have already gone before you, but it's just you. Now, here's the deal. How many of you have ever, now, when you go into a ball game, right? Y'all been to a ball game before? You go to a stadium and you go through the turnstile. Can I ask you a question? Do you leave through the turnstile? No, you don't leave through the turnstile. You just, everybody goes out, you know. So you can picture that as the Broadway. Everybody's leaving out. In that way. But picture yourself at the turnstile. You have to make the decision. You're there and you're getting ready to make the decision. You have, again, as Jesus, the Bible says the disciples have come, up, come away. They've come up to hear Jesus. And now Jesus says it's time to heed what you've heard. It's decision time. It's time to make that decision. Whether or not you're going to go the broad way. Or you're going to go the narrow way. And by the way, folks, the way never, ever changes in this life. It's always, always. Don't believe what people tell you. Believe what the Bible says. The way is always narrow until you leave this world. There's always going to be a fight. There's always going to be a battle. 
The Apostle Paul died and he said this, I have fought a good fight. Right? I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And all of them that love Christ appearing. Paul fought till the day his head was cut off. It was a narrow way all the way. And he had to give up some things. And that's what I want to look in the scriptures to see what you would think when you come down. When you come to a turnstile, who determines what you take in there? Do you? When you go to a ball game, can you take your own cooler? Can you take your gun? Can you take all these things? Or do you got to leave that outside? <coughs> Who decides that? You or them? Yeah. They do. So in order when you go into this turnstile of what God calls salvation and discipleship and all these things, who determines what you take when you walk through that turnstile? God does. Not you. But the problem is, we take a lot of things through that turnstile that don't belong. The number one thing is exactly, well, the first thing, not the one, the first thing that you have to do is you have to do what the disciples did to start with. They came away from the crowd of the world. They stepped away from the crowd in the world. And let me tell you something, folks. When you go through that turnstile, you got to put the world in the rearview mirror. You've got to decide in your life God's made you different. You're not like the world. You don't want to be a part of the crowd. Oh, boy. Are we there today? You see a whole lot of disciples today? You see a whole lot of people that have decided to follow Jesus, what come what may? The world behind me, the cross before me. By the way, Jesus said, if any man follow me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. It's every day. It's difficult, isn't it? It's hard. You see, the problem is we've had a lot of easy believism. And by the way, we're reaping that in the church today. Pray a prayer, all these other kind of things. But listen, I'll tell you, Jesus said count the cost. When you come to the cross, folks, you gotta, you got to recognize God's called you to a different life. You're willing to turn your back on the world in the crowd. You're not going to be a crowd pleaser. Turn with me if you would in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And let's read this passage of scripture. And then we'll go to the next thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. When you come to the turnstile, when you come to this walking through this life, and you make this decision, you've got to decide what you're going to do. You've got to decide what God says here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse number 14. This has not changed. This is what Jesus was saying right here all along. This is exactly what he said in John chapter 6 when the disciples walked away from him. He said to you, will you walk away also? And, they, and Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. He says this in verse number 14 in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Be ye not only be yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath, 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 hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And, with, and, and, and what concord hath Christ with Baal? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Okay? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said... I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. When you walk through that turnstile and you say yes to Jesus, you say no to the world and the, and, and the things of the world. He says, wherefore? Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Amen and amen. God said there's only one way. And that's his way. It's a narrow way. It's a straight gate. 
It's when you come there, you're saying to God when you're born again, by the way, don't buy into this and we've messed up here too. Somehow or another, we've we got a divided Savior. Tozer was preaching on this in the 40s and 50s and 60s. We say, well, I received Jesus as my Savior, but sometime later on in my life, I make Him Lord. No, no, no. When you got born again, you, He's your Savior and He is your Lord. Amen. 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 You don't make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. Amen. And when you were born again, saved by the grace of God, he is your life. He's called you away from the crowd. You're not to be like them. Amen. Number two. You see, because you can go through the turnstile and you can get away from the crowd. The crowd's over there, okay? I'm over here. But there's a second thing that needs to go left behind at the turnstile. And that's not just the world and the crowd, but the ways of the world and the crowd. Do you hear what it said? The ways of the world and the crowd. I would dare say 90 some of the percent of churches in America today need to hear that. Most of what we do today is the ways of the world to try to reach people. Most of the day, uh, again, we do exactly what Havner told us not to do. We've made the message acceptable and not just available. We've watered down the message. I've said to you this time and time again. Tozer said this, the gospel of his day. He was talking to his day. How much more so today? If it was poison, it's so watered down, it wouldn't kill anybody. And if it was medicine, it's so watered down, it wouldn't cure anybody. That's where we are today. But a whole lot farther than Tozer's day. Everybody's saved today. Because they prayed a prayer or they did something but have no changed life. They didn't walk through the turnstile. They're going the broad way. Because you're going to see the next thing that Jesus said in the next messages that we preach. Beware of false prophets. And there's plenty of them out there. Now I can dare say, and I know this in my own heart. You're not going to leave this church. Now it may happen because I could easily fall by the wayside. But I'm going to tell you, your pastor has preached the word of God here to you. I've tried my best to give you what God says and thus saith the Lord and not my own words. And you'll stand before God and I'll stand before God for what I've preached to you. But I'm going to tell you, you're not going to, it's not, you're not going to stand before me. You're going to stand before God. That's what you need to hear is God's word. Not what I have to say, but what he has to say. But you've got to leave the ways of the world. Turn in your Bible to 2 John chapter 2. In verse 15 and following, second, first John, excuse me, first John chapter 2. And notice what the Bible says here. Not only do you have to, 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 to leave the world and leave the crowd, but you've got to leave their ways also. Notice what John says here in verse number 15. Now, I was amazed teaching a Sunday school class about 20 years ago for Pastor Baker when I did a study of this. And you can, you can do a study of it yourself. It's amazing the word love here. Now you would think it was phileo, wouldn't you? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. No, 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 no. It's higher love. It's God's love. That's amazing, isn't it? I thought it was. 20 some years ago that God would use agape love and I believe he's saying this. Don't take the love, the high love that he's given you and love the world with it. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You see, there is not only the crowd in the world and sense of the people, in what they say, but it's also the world system, and that's what he's talking about here. And listen to me, folks. The world system is in everything. It's in everything. It's in the education system. It's in the political system. It's in the governmental system. It's in, in the sports system. It's in all the systems. Why? Because the prince of the power of the air is, is controlling things today. So he thinks. And God is sovereign over him. Boy, I'm going to read something to you in a minute that I hope will bless your swanee peoples' back soul. Amen. 
God help us. Some of you don't even know who Swanee Peoples is. Did that even sound right? I'm not sure. The ways of the world. You see, we carry in through this turnstile what we should be leaving behind. And that's the ways of the world. Listen, God's not in this for your pleasure so that you might be happy. No, it's so he would be glorified. And that's for your best. Amen. But we've so twisted that around. Just listen to the songs of today. Tozer said this, that he, he, he got on his knees and he every day just about sung a hymn as he worshiped God because these hymns were people that worship God. But I tell you, the songs of the day, most of them worship self. And it's all about my pleasure and all these things. When are we going to get it that, hey, our lives are to bring God pleasure? Amen. That's what he desires. We've got to put aside these things. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Boy, but we love this world system. We try to find, and by the way, most churches, again, folks, listen, they're run like businesses. This is not a business. This is not an organization. This is a living organism. It's to be led by God. Amen. He's the one that controls or should. Amen. Not somebody else, but what he says in his word. Amen. But yet, hey, we keep doing our own thing. You got to put that behind. When you come through this turnstile, you got to put away the crowd. You can't worry about what the crowd says. By the way, the crowd says a lot of things, right? But remember what Jesus said. Now, remember, they're going to persecute you, right? It's going to be bad. That's what he told us. Aren't you glad that he told us that at the beginning? Let me tell you something. Listen to me, folks. That's not the way the devil works. The devil tells you how good it is at the beginning, how great it's going to be, and then he destroys you and me. That's not what God does. He tells you right at the beginning, hey, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be an easy life, pie in the sky. I'm telling you, that's what we need to tell I remember Pastor Baker telling me this came to my mind as I was studying for this message. He, he said, he doesn't, he doesn't, when he's talking to somebody, and it really shocked me. It really did because of all my teaching, all that I got. Man, you need to make sure somebody gets saved right then. Man, you need to, you need to, hey, we need to teach you how to get them to get professions. Man, I'll tell you what, I'm not looking for professions for you. And neither is God. God's looking for possession. Amen. Of you. But man, I was so used to that. And this is what he told me. I sat down in his office. He was talking about somebody I was witnessing to. And, and he, said, he said, you know, I, I like to let people stew on it a little bit. I said, huh? What's stew mean? And what are you talking about? He said, I like to let them think about the decision that they're going to make. And how serious it is. Before they make the decision. I don't try to talk them into a decision. Once again, I quote Tozer. Anybody that can talk you into a decision... Some old bird can come right back again and talk you right out of it. Aren't you glad that it's the Holy Spirit that convicts and persuades and, and brings you to a place of repentance that he is right? Amen? So you got to get rid of the crowd. You can't be a crowd pleaser. you got to get away from the ways of the crowd. Now, people say, well, in my way, good. We ain't talking about whether your way is good. We're talking about what God says in his word. Amen? <laughs> Listen, folks. Trying to think of uh, what mama used to say. I wasn't born yesterday. You see, there's all kinds of things we're doing today that's our own methods. God's not interested in you and I's methods. You come his way or no way. Amen. And then last of all, man, this is the hardest one. You know what it is, don't you? That you got to leave when you walk through the turnstile. Paul says it over and over again. And, and you know what? We're all, you know what we're all trying to do? How many of you have done this before? Tried to go and run back and go through the turnstile you came through to get what you left over there. Y'all ain't never done that? I have. It don't work. Oh, what a, what a, what a illustration that is. Praise God, ain't it? <laughs> Once you're in, you're in, and you can't go back through that turnstile and get out, somebody say amen right there, praise God. But you know what? We're like the Hebrews. We're always trying to go back and get something over there. And this is what we really try to go back that we're supposed to leave over there. You know who it is, don't you? 
It's all through this sermon. It's you. It's self. This is something you're going to deal with for the rest of your life. Paul puts it like this. Put off the old man and put on the new man. It's a continual, right? This is a battle that we face. But that's okay. You know why? Because God has won the battle. Amen. Listen, it's not that you, well, it is that you can't do this <laughs> on your own. But what you can do is yield yourself to God and say, God, what you require is impossible for me to do. But I know according to your word, you can do it. Let me lead you somewhere, and I really hope this will be a blessing to your heart. It, it sure was a blessing to me. I'm going to read you a, a very familiar passage of Scripture first. And then I'm going to read to you an unfamiliar passage of Scripture. Okay? Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. No, excuse me, chapter 6. Oh, folks, listen to me. God is so good. His word is wonderful. You can take, if we would, oh, if you take the Bible and learn what God says, amen. You can get through this life. Look what he says about this life. Verse number 11, no, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual witness, wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take upon you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Are we in that day? Yes. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and have it on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the gospel of the preparation of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil or the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, let me tell you something. That sounds good on paper, doesn't it? We can quote that all day long, but it's not going to do you any good unless you know what God says in Ephesians chapter 1. <laughs> I love Watchman Nee's book, Sit, Walk, and Stand. It's one of the best books ever written on the book of Ephesians. That's what this book, listen, think about it. For just a moment. Sitting is what type of, what is it a type of? It's a, mm -hmm. you're doing what? You're in a position. You're in a position. The early part of Ephesians is all about your position <clears throat> in Christ. And then the middle part of it is about walking in Christ. That little baby, J.J., he has no clue how to walk. You know what he's learning right now? He's learning how to sit. Now, when he sits on my lap, Hannah gets a little upset, Karen gets a little upset, and everybody else in the room gets a little upset. You know why? Because I let my arms off of him. I got him. They just don't know I got him. He doesn't even know I got him. But I got him. They think they got more concern over them than I do. They don't. And neither do I got more concern than they do. I'm just trying to teach him how to sit. And get his balance. So he can know his position. See, he'll never walk till he learns how to sit. Amen, preacher. And you'll never learn how to walk in God until you learn how to sit in the position that he's given you. That you're secure in him. And then he gets to the part standing. That's why I said you'll, you'll never stand. You see, hey, you know as well as I know, J.J. starts walking, he's going to start following. You know why? Because he can't stand. <laughs> he starts walking. He's just going. He, hey, this is something, bam. 
He don't know how to stand. Right? Mm -hmm. He's learned how to walk. He's got his position. He knows he can do it. He just can't stop. <laughs> then he stops. <laughs> He's like, wow. I'm standing. Ephesians 1. Boy, look at this passage of scripture. It's a beautiful passage of scripture. I wish. Whew. I've read it over and over again. Matter of fact, I read it this week. But it really didn't speak to me till this week, the way it spoke to me. I knew, I knew Ephesians 6. Man, this is a fight, man. We're fighting not, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. I knew this is a battle with evil spirits and all kinds of things. A battle with me. But then I want you to notice what Paul says here. And this is what I say to you for this message. And this is the way I want to pray for you. This is how I want, want you to pray for me. He said, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, verse 15, I'm sorry. Wherefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What's he praying, Paul? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling, what is the riches of the glory of, of his inheritance in the saints. This is all at the turn's tile. This is what you're going into. He said this was the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, because that's what it takes to go through the turnstile. Belief, faith, and trust in God. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ. Now listen to this. When he raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in heaven, in heavenly places. This is it right here. Far above all principality. What you war against? Principality. And power. What you war against? high places and might and dominion and every name that is named <laughs> not only in this world but also in that which is to come and he had put all things not some things under his feet every single circumstance Every hard time that you and I go through, when we go through that turnstile, it's under the Lord's feet. And it's for our good and his glory. The reward, the great reward, is at the end of this life. But I'm telling you, it's narrow. It's straight. He says, they put all things under his feet and given him to be the head over all things, the church, which is his body. And the fullness of him that filleth all and in all. You see, I'm telling you, we can sing the songs and we can sing this song. It will be worth it all. Can we sing that when we see Jesus? Can you find that? See if it's in there. If it's not in there, then we'll do something else. Why? Because this narrow is the way that leadeth to everlasting life. Very few people find it. Why? I'll tell you why. Because there's very few people searching for it. You want, and I want, what the world has. But we also want what God has. And we've already learned from this sermon, you cannot serve two masters. You can't do it. There is no riding the fence with God. But yet we see it all the time. Not in there. Not in there. So we can't sing it. But one day, it will be worth it all. Right now, there's trial, there's tribulation, there's battles. And that's why Jesus said, no man, he, he doesn't build a tower without first counting the cost. No man goes to fight against 20,000 and he's only got 10,000. Right? Unless he knows. 
And you see, praise God, I hope you know, when you walk through that turnstile of salvation and discipleship, God is in control of every circumstance and every hardship and every battle that you face. If you turn it to him, again, it'll be for your good and his glory. There's no need to turn back. By the way, I said this to you before several times too because Kenny Baldwin said it and I like it. Not just because he said it, but it's true. If it was up for Kenny Baldwin to keep himself out of hell after he got saved, Kenny Baldwin would be back in hell. If it was up for you to keep yourself saved, you'd be back in hell too. Because all of us have times of confusion where we turn back and we, we don't understand and all these other kind of things that go on. But we must remember, again, who is our God? Who are we? And either we're going to walk in the ways of God, step away from the crowd, the ways of the world, or we're just going to keep going the broad way. I'll tell you, there's a lot of Christians on the broad way, unfortunately. I hope truly they've been born again, saved by the grace of God. I believe this. Somebody texted me this week. They're going all kinds of things. There's all kinds of things you can get from the scriptures. I'm going to tell you, if you don't receive chastisement, then you're not one of his. That's what Hebrews 12 says. I didn't say it. God said it. And we didn't understand that. Amen? And so, hey, there, there might be many people that are on, going on the broad way, living on the broad way. And, but I'll tell you what, God's chasing them, if they are, to bring them back. Or he's going to take them out of here. Right? Let's stand to our feet, every head bowed, every eye closed, but Randy comes with Melanie. The challenge has been made. Jesus has given the sermon, and now the, the opportunity comes for each one of us to take heed for what we've heard. What will you decide? It doesn't matter what your neighbor decides. It doesn't matter what your husband, your wife, your children, everybody else, your friends. The question is, what are you going to decide? How are you going to choose, again, to obey what you've heard? All of us need this message. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for who you are. God, you know the struggles and the battles that we all face. Father, I thank you for Ephesians 1 just as well as I thank you for Ephesians 6. Father, unless I know the position that I have in thee, that I'm in thee, so therefore your feet, I'm in there. And so all my problems are under your feet because they're under the feet of the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that if I daily walk with you, I'd learn how to stand in this wicked world. And so, Father, you know our failures. You know, you know our hearts, Father. God, turn us, help us, help us, dear God to see our need. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name for his sake. Amen. 480, only trust him. You come. God spoke into your heart.